Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Chino Zucchi. Hello to everybody. I'm Chino Zucchi. I'm a principal of Chino Zucchi Architetti Milano. I also teach in the university. And I start from a consideration back from my student time. When I was a student of architecture, I heard all my professor generate big theories. And then at that time, internet was not there. I would go on magazines and look at their uh, works. And many times I really felt disappointed. I could not find a particular relationship between the big words they say and the works. So that was very disappointing. So it's a little bit embarrassing for an architect also to be a professor, but also be a practicing architect. Many times in Italy, professors do not have not much to show. So what I'm going to talk about today is a sort of split brain uh, situation. In the first part, I would say some consideration I have about the practice of architecture, but in a little bit more theoretical way. And in the second part, I would find the occasion to not to apply, apply directly what I said, but um, to show how these considerations somehow they um, can be dealt with in a very everyday practice. So everybody has, today, the communication problem is a big one and architects, especially in front of journalists, they have to simplify and find slogans. I also have some experience in American universities and I've seen fights between Harvard and Princeton and Yale about branding, landscape architecture, you know, all this and that. So many times today, if you're not able to simplify in a slogan what you think you did, so in a little bit ironical way, I gave a name to my own theory, but it's a quite cryptic name. It's called the campsite shower theory, and you will understand it later on in my presentation. Oops, my screen does not work. Okay. So the issue of teaching and learning. We can say we are learning animals. We learn from direct experience, but also dogs do. But the particularity of humans is that we can also learn from manuals. You know, uh, these are all manuals, how to get thin, uh, the art of getting rich, uh, marital happiness, you know, the, the cure of shyness, the art of being a man, uh, feminine psychology, uh, customs of high society. So you find a manual for everything and today on the internet you can learn how to build a bomb or do something else just by reading the experience of others. So in a way, the treasuring in a written way many times, the experience of others, it's an interesting question. It got us uh, much in a much higher way in all the sciences and the arts, but Ludwig Wittgenstein, at least you know, 90 years ago almost, he said this, the young people of today suddenly find themselves in a situation in which a strange request of life, a good average intelligence not, not sufficient anymore. It's not enough, in fact, to be good players. Rather, a question comes up again and again, which is the right game and is this the right game to play right now? What it means that the issue, the attempt of creating a method, especially with the modern movement, we thought that we could start from zero to have data analysis and then following a step-by-step -step procedure, we could get people to do good design. It's a sort of an illusion. But the question is, what game to play and why to play right now, it seems for the complexity of our society, this is the question. So the modern movement tried to, uh, in a way, I'm, I'm simplifying, of course, but I said, okay, let's wipe out shapes and forms and tradition, what we know. We have to start from scratch to deal with a problem of a new world, of a new society, of a new technology. So, and in a way, copying a bit 
the exact sciences. The idea was create uh, a process that could generate a design in a sort of input output model in a sort of parascientific way. So the black box is what we could call a method. You would get data analysis and then the thing comes out. We have a very simple example of this input output. If you go in a car, you press the pedal, you know, the more you press the pedal, the, the faster the car goes. And then when you see the police, you sort of break down or slow down and the car stops. But then in some input output mechanism, the time factor is there. So we could say that the output is sort of delayed in respect with the input. So if today we choose to try to make a baby, actually these are images taken from a manual or found hidden in the, in the library of my grandfather. He was a socialist. It was hidden under Marx capital. It was a manual for positions. But then the baby comes out and the population changes after. This is a diagram of the Japanese population right after the Second World War, 1950. There were almost no old men. They all died and a lot of young people. To 2005, you have that, but the forecast is that we will have much more old people. So it could be that the next an input of today, the influence is not direct, but it takes some time to get there. So we could apply a time delay factor to the input output model. So if we try to diagram architecture as a process of input output, let's admit for a moment it is, what is the input of architecture? If architecture is a pro process, what are its inputs? One could say, again, to make a bit of a caricature, that in the old times, the classical architect, the Trugian architect, the input was culture. What you see on the left is an authentic drawing by Palladio. It is a measure drawings of some Roman ruins. Palladio went to Rome to measure them. And then on the right, you see its famous uh, rotonda, a villa. More than a villa, it looks like a temple. So the architect. Also, the, the layman, the, the farmer, could build his own house with his own hands. But the architects, it was who knew about tradition and how to trace an ionic order. Then, today, I think we'll be split in two. Uh, what is considered an architect it's, uh, depends very much on the situation you're in. So, on one side, you have architects which they draw directly from inspiration. This is the famous Carlo Molino, Italian architect. He was a little bit of a pornographer. The photo on the left, you see, it's his own chair, but also he took his friends as models. And that's him, you know, in a, he was like a superhero. And then you, he made a discotheque, he's still existing, in a quite new Baroque, very excessive way. So once I met Bernard Schumi in Milano and with his students, and he said, oh no, Cino Zucchi, now today you have only two kinds of architects the signature architects who go and went like this, and then the production architects who put elevators in the building. But the other way they look at us is somehow some kind of architect and engineers, technician, who looks at the problem, in this case is Jean Prouvé, looking at destroy Euro after the Second World War, uh, designing you know, temporary houses for the people, the homeless, you know, after the bombing, is ideally be like Norman Fosterish idea. So this sort of signature inspiration architects and the architect as a white collar technicians are um, both present in the popular opinion. That's the way people see architects today. Sometimes it's a little bit in a contradiction. But then talking about method, uh, classical architecture, in a way, what one could see classicism as a way to give, even to a mediocre person, a, a sequence to do things and he can get the correct way. This is a page from the famous Etienne Louis Duran, um, you know, Presides Architecture. It says, step, sorry, steps to follow uh, in the design of anything. That's really interesting, you know, it's like you could do, and you go, 
uh, one, uh, sorry, the, um, the number of situation of the main axis, two, you draw the secondary axis, three, you trace the walls, four, you place the columns, and then five, that's it. You get the perfect you know, new building. In reality, as you see, the fragments are classical. They're taken from the Pantheon or the Basilica di Massenzio. But then they smooth out to be like a Lego. To do that, you need to reduce the components to add up like a little bit transformers. So it's like you know, how to draw a cat. You draw the tail like this and this and that. So everybody following one, two, three, four, five could get to the, the results. If you type method on internet today, you get thousands. As everybody can invent his own diet, everybody can invent his own sort of design method. You know? So it's a flow chart. And the idea is that you follow the flow chart and you get the result. This, of course, simplified attitude was also applied to city planning. On the left, you see the famous Victor Gruen uh, say abstract city model, you know, and on the right, this was actually the cover of a book my father bought in 1964. He brought me back from the New York fair. And I was sure when I was a little boy that when I grew up, I would live in this city, maybe like the Jetsons. This city also to me is a sort of metaphor of how function is uh, deal with cities. We took the single function, the function of moving, the function of dwelling, the function of having fun, the function of working. We gave a single response to all this, and then we put it on all together. So this is the assemble of single responses. Very few cities uh, has been totally planned this way. Some of have. You have a lot of these models. On the left, the broad upper city by Franklin Wright. And on the right, you have Chandika by Le Corbusier, the capital of Punjab. I will not go through all the story of Chandika, which is actually more complicated, but we can consider Chandigarh uh, a foundation city, the founded city on a very strong political issue, because of course, after the war, the Muslims and the Hinduists uh, you know, separated in two after the English colonies, and you had a lot of migration of people. So, Chandigarh is a political issue, but, sorry. Sorry. By chance, some, my, my computer is a bit slow in responding. Um, some years ago, it happened to me that I could go to uh, Chandigarh to visit. I actually never been there. And it was a little bit shocking. Sorry. It's very slow in changing the slides. Why? Just a second. Because we have everything else open. Just a second. Okay, we finished. Uh, might be too many things on my. Maybe it's better. Okay, let's go back. Okay, sorry, I missed some um, pictures, but just to say that I had the occasion to go to Chandigarh to visit it. And what I saw, it was in a way quite different from what I saw in the books. It's a completely designed cities, which has been living for some years and with the adaption of people to their own needs. So you have fragments of very iconic pieces of Le Corbusier together with everyday life. For example, you have this famous Brissolet, and then since Punjab is a very damp place, 
that was not enough to give a good climate. So they had put uh, air conditioners all over. And what would be the symbol of the parliament is a barbed wire. So the big Campidoglio square by the Corbusier is totally cut in two. You, you, to cross from one side to the other, you have to go through a checkpoint because of political, again, you had uh, things. And then you know this, this, this poetics of the Corbusier of exposed concrete and round columns has been in a way decorated and adapted to everyday life. So you have a po the Corbusierian ideal and then uh, people adapting it to their own needs. This problem of, let's say, uh, user adaption has been tried to be modeled again, inserting again in this input-output model, the idea of a feedback. A feedback is uh, the output that goes back and re-influence uh, the input. So can we apply the feedback model to this sort of scientific thing and to evolve? You know, we have many examples of uh, feedback. And one, for example, is a self-balancing feedback. It's typical for, uh, for a plane when the plane gets out of the vertical, you get more pressure on the underneath of the tail. The reason the plane is made in two is because of this. So this is a case of a now self-correcting feedback. And, but also we have cases of feedback which amplify when we have like music distortion. But then also in a feedback model, we can apply the time delay. There's a mathematics of it. We could say that uh, if we try to re-influence the input with the output, it could take some time. And this is where my name comes from. If we go in a sort of campsite shower and we try to take a hot bath, we start to open the water and it's really cold. So we freeze. So then we start turning up the hot water faucet, but for a while nothing happens because the water takes some time to go through it. So we steer and steer and steer, and then we risk to get too hot. And then we correct it back, and it takes some time until we get it to the right uh, solution. The mathematics of it is about oversteering. In a way, the only way to deal with it is having patience, to have some, to wait some time for your correction to act. So we, if we are too nervous, you really can get hot and cold very time. So this diagram you see, it's a sort of self-balancing after one. And, um, but then somehow, I think modernism uh, could not describe completely how things are done. If you apply the input-output model, it means at every new uh, input, you would have a different result. So, you know, this engineer idea that the engineer has no formal prejudice. This is what Claude Levi-Strauss said in, in his famous uh, The Savage Mind book. And for some reason, when we look at human artifacts, we have a feeling that uh, it's not true we start every time from nothing. But then we are a little bit copycats. That's what I called many years ago an installation in things. So, one could say that when an idea comes, we tend to communicate with copying animals. And we can even, you know, in these days, we're talking about the epidemiology of COVID, but sometimes ideas can be viral. So this is a set of um, uh, photographers. It's fantastic. I think every time you think you're unique, you have at least 12 people uh, thinking and dressing like you. So can we think of people, instead of all this idea of having, I'm new, I'm original, admit that humans as social animals, also they tend to imitate and forms. And that's the way what we could call a formal culture. These, these people go around uh, Milano or Rotterdam, they pick up people, they picture them. The names are very funny. I love the, this uh, corpus on, on the left. They, they look casual, but they all have part of the shirt out. And 
While I was going on a Vespa to the university, I started taking pictures of fragments of facades in Milano from uh, after the Second World War. Uh, this sort of abstract texture, almost familiar, it means uh, left alone the, let's say, the masterpieces of architecture. You know, we have quite good architecture from the 50s and 60s. This is the no name architecture, maybe what Rudowski would have called the architecture without architects, but still we feel that these things have something in common. You know? So can we think about what we could call material cultures also in architecture? And this mechanism of imitation also happened, for example, in coins. This is the history of Roman coins copied again and again in let's say barbarian times where the coins was precious, but each copy did not know the original. So uh, the copy of a copy of a copy lost, like in, in English you call it a Chinese whispers. We say telefono senza fili. Uh, there's a slight deformation and in a way evolution of copying things again. So can we look at the human artifacts? These are the famous Bernanilla Becker pictures as we an entomologist, almost a Darwinian way of uh, the mechanism of trial and error who generates also, also technical forms. This is a sort of a history of the cell phone and is also the, the history of uh, a kind of particular kind of guitar in Spanish guitar. Could we apply some kind of evolutionary model to the development of architectural technical forms. But the evolutionary model of the first, uh, you know, the last century was somehow linear. You know, it, 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 it went into a line, but the real situation is more like a tree with a lot of dead branches. For example, we recently discovered we also, the Neanderthal men almost totally disappear, you know, the Cro-Magnon men. So even men, uh, we have two or three um, dead branches even of men as we have of horses. So the path up to there is not linear, but it's more like a cespuglio, a bush. So I tried to put my own, uh, I took some sketches of my own uh, building. We were doing a competition for an office building and I tried to uh, arrange it under a sort of Darwinian model where of all the schemes, some present an evolution, but some were the branches. The one on the right corner wins. My computer is slow and changing. Maybe it's too heavy there. Oof. So this idea of failure, you know, Samuel Beckett used to say, try again, fail again, feel better. Can we think of the process of designing as a trial and error where you have an idea and then you check it against? So the idea is that the inputs do not contain completely all the data to generate the form. I'm sorry, let me try again to switch off something because for some reason, um. So when we think at the original sketch, I don't know who invented keep calm and carry on who will get a lot of money, but why certain things get more viral than others? That's a good, a good question. Then before getting to showing my own work, I would say that we could deal also with the issue of time. 
somehow the products of architecture survived their own genesis. This is actually a famous Piranesi uh, tomb on uh, Appiantica, and that's what's there. You know? So uh, forms and buildings tend to survive the process that generated them. These are pictures of abandoned commercial centers, America, and the paradox is that there's nothing more functionalist than a commercial center, but then when a commercial center fails or you know, it's like a money machine, it's very hard to reuse it. This, these uh, visions are quite scary. But um, strangely, some very traditional spaces like the typical Italian square can be the backdrop of very different social things. This is a, a photo by Matilde Cassani. She's a very good young Italian architect. And she pictured a community of Sikh people from uh, Sikh is a, is a sect, uh, you know, is a religious sect in, in India. And they, since they're very good cattle um, carers, they inhabit the, the pianura and then they have the annual feast. So the typical, almost Fellini-like Italian square can be the back, backdrop, survived and give a backdrop to everyday life in the city. So in Milano, the whole hospital is now university and is also used for events. And the old Jesuit college is became the academy. You have cases where very strong spaces that survive to their own original function. This idea of permanence should be taken as an input or not. Uh, Christopher Alexander criticized the functionist mode of, in his famous article, A City is Not a Tree. He said, Modern, modernist pla planning tried to generate the sequence where single dwellings were generating buildings and then we generated new towns and so on. But then this tree model is too deterministic. The historical city works, works rather as a semi-lattice, as a grid where each node is connected to more part instead of being a pure tree. Today, we are also considering that this sort of spread out suburban model is very unecological. In reality, very low density cities like Houston or Phoenix are much more energy consuming than the dense European uh, cities. So we are rediscovered that density not only could give good quality to urban life, but also for a lot of reason is not the time to, to, to explain here, is much more ecological in terms of uh, consumption. So we have an anguish today about you know, climate change and the environmental disaster. And the more we feel guilty for planet Earth, the more we, put, we try to put together high density with the green model. I think that these images, they show, we see the magazines full of these images, are very fascinating, but I feel they're not real cities. I am um, think that the, uh, you know, this is just to say, to pay due to our conscience, to try to transform buildings into, in a shape, in a way, into natural metaphors. And in a way, without being nostalgic, I think that European cities still have a lot of things to say of putting together high environmental quality with good architecture. This is a typical Parisian scene, plus the Vosges or Bath, you know, like this. Can we not necessarily go back to the past, but see how the man-made world can these two things live together? And, you know, especially in this uh, COVID time, uh, I've been responding to like 20 interviews, tell us architect Zucchi, how we will live tomorrow, how we will live in a post-COVID world. But if we go back to see all the futurologies, you know, half of them, we got it right, but half of them, they were just a projection of the life at their time, you know. So you can see in the futur futurologies of the past, also a lot of languages and lifestyles 
So in a way, the Jetsons are just a projection of an American suburban family. In uh, 1972, it was the first attempt from an MIT team to, uh, to see how the system worked. And they wrote this famous book, The Limits to Growth. They made an algorithm, put it together, food, economy, ecology. And really, this showed that something beyond years 2000, the whole thing would collapse almost. It was very scary. When I read this book, I was in high school. I decided to go to MIT to study at MIT. And then they discovered then, you know, after 30 years, somebody said, hey, but, uh, you know, we made all this prediction, but see how this is really work. So uh, they made a, a, an update to the book, the 30 year update. And you can see on the right how, uh, you know, the lines were the projection and the dotted lines is how things really went. For example, at that time, nobody could imagine internet. So in a way, the predictions were somehow not so bad, but even prediction needs some kind of feedback. So today, the new of this world is that we have a lot of instruments or predictive instruments and way of analysis with the computers who could simulate what will happen, but we could be a little bit wrong about it. You know, uh, in the COVID was a, what is called a black swan, you know, you could, pr every projection, even with artificial intelligence, is inducti inducting of the data you have. So any uh, un um, unforeseen event can totally change, but if it's unforeseen, it's not written what was there. This is true also for big data. You know, if we are, an analysis of personality of big data, the people use it commercially, is only projecting in the future, what you already are. So in a way, these projections are dangerous because they don't take in account any variation. You know, they're just very linear in a way, even if they could be very sophisticated. Okay, so to uh, go to the second part of my speech, I will try to quickly show you some works I did forget all everything you, you saw up to now. And just to say that this sort of slowness of architecture, the fact that the response of architecture is in a way slow in respect to the input. So it could happen that the output is not, um, in, in the meantime that we build architecture, especially in Europe, which is lower, probably if you're going to buy times are much quicker, but in Europe, many times it takes a long time. It, it happened to me that we have projects in the studio who are like 15 or even 20 years old. The average time of big urban projects is not less than six, seven, eight years. So by the time you finish it, you would all the, the, the conditions have changed. So these are just pretext to show some of my work to see how this delay between input and response could be dealt with. And the first one is, could we do what we could call just-in-time design? And I go very quickly, I will not explain every single project because it would take too much time, just to show some condition we, of work we are put in. This is a competition we won in Lugano. It's Italian speaking part of uh, and we actually, we did a quite big master plan. So this is the master plan related to a new gallery coming from the highway, which generates a new entry to the town, which was not there. It was a dead end valley. And sorry, some 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 slides are skipping. And. Uh, the people in the original project had some kind of a pedestrian connection from a garden to the other side over this new roundabout for the highway. Okay. 
And the people from the street, we, we won the master plan, we did the master plan, but they said, oh, we like this. If you transform it into a sound barrier, then we can pay for it. So this was an initial uh, proposal to do both a path connecting to levels across the thing, but also with the sound barrier. Then um, there was uh, the galleries was built, and for some time you needed they could not realize the roundabout, so um, they asked us to do a very temporary screen to screen their roadworks. So this is a project we did in like fifteen days. We took some uh, wooden poles. We took some PVC tubes, so it's a very low-tech project, just something, a temporary project will last three, four, five years to screen the construction work and to give a, so a pleasant look out when you get out of the gallery. Again, on the time of the just-in-time project, I'm showing this first strategy. Can we compress extremely the time of design? In this case, we had the, the, the theme was to build a temporary, uh, not a temporary, an automatic warehouse with a robot in it. It was high, 28 meters high. It was in the back of this factory. This is a very plain factory of uh, these people to chairs. And since it was very high, Basically, it was a box totally designed by the, the engineering in it. So even the structure did not exist. The scaffolding hold up the structure. So this is the interior, and you have this robot going up. So in a way, it was the, almost a camouflage project. And we had only to pack the stereo to make it pleasant to the, to the city, because there was a limit of 10 meters. But this was 28 meters. It was a very, very bulky building. And then we just took some aluminum pieces. We painted uh, on one side in three shades of green and on the other side, just aluminum color. And this is an interesting project because uh, it reacts very much to light. This actually, the one you see now is the color aluminum side, but if you see on the left, you get the color you see is not the actual color, is the reflection you get from the other side. So it's a, it changes very much with the sun because of the shadow, but also because of the reflection of the color. This is the only place we took out a drawer just to see that it was a totally blind uh, palette-like uh, structure. And here you see this funny, uh, reaction to the to the sun this is the facade which is all aluminium the side which is all aluminium at 10 o'clock in the morning oh, sorry it skips Um, sorry, I'm skipping a slide. Maybe if I shut off, Anastasia, maybe if you shut off the my face, it maybe is too, the connection is not so good. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Um, can I interrupt for one second and I take away some slides? I think some images I put are very heavy. Let me just interrupt for one second. I'm sorry. Uh, one second. I interrupt the division. And I'm saving my presentation as a PDF because it seems too heavy to hold the PowerPoint. Just give me one second and I reopen the PDF. Um, can you hear me again? It okay, I, I. I saved it in um, Okay, I hope you're giving us no more problem. So again, talking about uh, just in time design, this was uh, the Italian pavilion for the Biennale. It was one of the most uh, fast projects I ever did. It took me only three, four months. I will not go through it. The team was called grafting because we're in colors. We did, the idea was that Italian architecture in modernism had a very complex um, uh, layering. So he had to do a little bit more sophisticated strategies. Then he was at the Biennale. And since the team was grafting something, grafting on something else, we made a portal. It was a very modern portal, but also related to this by the architecture. This was the entrance. I will not go through the content of the projects, but then I curated both the show and the setup. This was the idea that the city was very layered. So it was the plan of Milano with all the, also the uh, undone projects on it. it. We had these almost chapels. And what is interesting about the architecture in Milano that after the war was very heavily bombed, the reconstruction was thought that we had a decision while Rotterdam and Dresden has been rebuilt on very modernistic plan after the Allied bombing. 
In this case, Milano tried to keep the existing morphology. So this is a master plan where the gray buildings are the existing one and the white are the new ones. And you see, this is actually the, an aerial picture of the same area. You see this famous skyscraper is called the Torre Velasca in Milano, the old hospital. So Milano, after the reconstruction, is a very strange mixture of all the new, where the buildings, even the skyscrapers, try to um, had a base which gave some kind of facade to the streets. It's a very interesting modes of reconstruction. So basically, we design and both the content and the shape, this was the outside space of the Biennale, in a very quick way. So it's an architecture which is also an event. Let's say. So to go to other techniques, one was shorting up the time of design. The second is uh, having more sophisticated modeling instruments. This was what is called the BIM. You can simulate completely all the process, even the construction process in a sort of digital twin, I would say. And this was a competition we won for the headquarters of Saleva. Saleva, they produce mountaineer jackets. And it was a lot of logistics. We did a quite complex projects, but um, we designed so quickly, we gave more than every detail the rules to the construction people to follow and to develop them. So this is not designing each single panel, but to generate the laws. This was the bid to build this, how they should join the, you know, the, these panels to, to have a correct way. So to put some, what in American could say, fast track design. This was the construction. And this is like, it's very, it since there's a lot of noise from the highway, is the side of the highway is very close. It's like a landmark. And half of it is just big logistics. And on the other side, which is more protected, we have the highest, um, uh, how can I say, uh, rock climbing school. This was actually Reynold Mesner uh, opening up the, um, the event. And this is the youngest uh, climbing. This really became the standards for the climbing uh, halls of today. Then we have offices overlooking the parking. And this is the logistics. All the trucks go from this way. And uh, this is very self-sufficient. We produce all the energy we, we can have. Even we give it to the city. But this image of camouflage, uh, I took these pictures on the other side of the highway, and on the left, the white building is the typical industrial building in the industrial zone of um, Bolzano. Bolzano is a German-speaking part of Italy in the north. And uh, as you see, our building is almost at times, because of the color, camouflaging into the landscape, but it's also a landmark. So it goes from camouflaging to be the first building you see when you enter from the highway. Uh, Bolzano actually is a very, let's say, landmark building. Everybody knows it because of its content, but also because it's the first building you see as you enter the city, you approach the city. Then, uh, especially in urban projects, I would like to talk about flexibility. Uh, urban projects in Italy, but also in Europe, it, sometimes they take even 10 or 15 years to, to go. And as we know, we had a lot of economical crisis recently. So um, how can we embed, let's say, sliding door future into urban projects? Very quickly, I go through um, a project we did in Helsinki. Helsinki is, quite, is in Finland. And there was the site of a suburban station with a very, very big, um, let's say, um, railway yard that could be reshaped because they changed the location of the harbor. So the theme was to put some urbanization, both housing and offices, because it's a mixed quarter, in this area without closing off the tracks. And there was a 15 meters jump from the top to the bottom from the two levels. So we had this sort of infrastructure valley. And I'm going very quickly. I, we proposed a mixed use uh, project which 
would not, uh, still the city would be cut in two, but the level of the bridge, as we see, the, the existing bridge was embedded into our projects. And uh, together with the whole of the station, the project also had an enlargement of the station, but the red you see is all some kind of uh, misuse uh, commercial on the north of the bridge. So the red is mixed use and the brown is uh, residential and, and things. So to not to close down the infrastructure to create an urban connection between the two. And this was, uh, and then the Nokia, uh, you know, like 20 years ago, everybody had a Nokia cell phone, but Nokia did not understand very well the smartphone would lead. And uh, Finland had like, actually a big crisis because of Nokia, because Nokia sort of got the wrong street. And nobody has a Nokia today. We all have other kinds of smartphones, but that was different. So the whole program changed a bit because of this overall crisis. And they called us in 2009 to complete the master plan with higher towers. But the innovation is to mix residential and offices in the same tower, which is not so easy. So this is a new master plan, a little bit more detailed on the base on the old master plan it was approved. We have this, uh, the, the, the top part, the housing is 40% and office is down. And then you have a lot of vertical connection. And this was a master plan, but then people wanted to go very high density for ecological reason, because the very little parking here. So the idea is that to densify next to big uh, transportation hubs is a very good thing. But then um, uh, fin Finnish people in Helsinki were afraid of towers. They had cases of very ugly skyscraper. So they said, Zuki, not only do a master plan, only also show us that skyscrapers would be pretty. And I said, I don't know. You know, skyscrapers are good if they're done by good architects. They wanted a sort of a, a model. So it's not only a, a master plan design of the open spaces. This is, let's say, the an office plan, and this is residential plan. As you see, they have saunas all over the place, and common, of course, Helsinki has a rather cold climate. But then they also ask us to do a simulation. So these are not real projects, but to show that a place like this could be could host different uh, architectures. And I think our real project in the end was not the skyscraper, but the open space. I see, I, this is a bit of a joke, but say Italians are good in making towers. This is a famous medieval city, San Gimignano. But our speciality is this, this is still San Gimignano. This idea that you could do a concave open space. I said, if they call us all the way to Italy, we should give them a little bit, not of stylistic Italy, but this capacity of Italians to do very cozy open spaces. This is another uh, master plan we did for Tirana, Albania. Uh, you know, the, the, the political situation very strange after in the last 10 years, Tirana had 1 million more inhabitants. So they, they, they go from a rather small scale to a total um, three quarters of this building are just almost like squatter houses with no streets. So the project tried to continue the existing, they call it the Boulevardi, actually was designed uh, by Italians. Al Albania was not an Italian colony, but the Boulevard is from uh, Italian, but to transform it to some green thing, which would connect an urban situation to the hill and the, the river. I will not go through in the detail, but also to try to make some kind of strategy to, um, to intervene in this quarter housing. We need to cut some new streets because it was impossible to reach them. And on the other side, uh, to uh, absorb into this very ambitious plan all the regularities and the very small fragmented scale what was there. So it really had to respond to different scales, some kind of institutional monumental one connecting the boulevard to the green with the opera house, the city hall and all that, but also try to intervene. See, this is the idea that on the left, you have the existing situation of very small single family houses built with no streets. So we could make some kind of blocks 
which could host in the interior also this kind of fabric to everyday life. So it was the idea that you propose a model that could slowly transform into something else, even in time, or maybe accept a little bit that. You couldn't just not wipe out the whole thing. Going very quickly, um, we, you know, there's a lot of reasoning in Italy about you know, uh, housing models, about co-working, co-housing, single women, and this and that. So this was a, just a sketch we did. A newspaper in Milano said, Chino Zucchi tell us, you know, again, what to live. But some years after, in 2014, Milano had uh, the expo, and it was required to build a super dense and super quick uh, housing for the employees of the expo, you know, people who came here only temporary. So uh, I will not go through the master plan was not ours. They made rather dense, uh, like citadel, I would say, next to the expo, hosting all the people, and then it became social housing. So the deal was to build something very quick to host all the employees of the expo, and then after the event to transform into social housing. So this was the cheapest, quickest, and um, densier project we did. We designed two of these two towers. You see how thick it is, and this going up. This is a typical floor plan. And even it was meant, so during the expo, you could have all rooms, almost no living room, just a kitchen. And then after the expo, you could, uh, let's say, tear down a wall and make living room out of a living room. The theme is the highest towers is 80 meters high. And you know, the question is how to deal even with the question of scale. So it's also a former question of what is skyscraper. What is interesting, actually, they did not build it uh, because of uh, now the building and now the finishing now. It's a long story, but we also designed the, the open spaces. But what is interesting is that how all these cluster towers are designed by others, we're just uh, finishing it now because our project was the only one who could be, uh, let's say, delayed because of constructive reason. But then this was all the employees of the expo uh, living in it because it was in a way social experiment, how each person coming from all over the world would take his own uh, you know, lifestyles and adapt to spaces. That's very interesting. I think I went a little bit overboard, so maybe I skip a couple of projects. I skip this, which is also a project in flexibility. I'm sorry, I went a bit overboard. And maybe I even skip this, which is the car museum. This project has to do, as you see here, transforming existing structure into new entities. So it's about reuse, even heavy reuse. This was the existing car museum in Torino. The black is the existing part from the 60s, and uh, the white is what we added. But I will skip it and go quickly. So I'm more interested to show you other projects. So the facade you see here is the existing one. It's a good architecture from the 50s, but the backside is totally ours and is a bit less screen. Skip it. OK. This is a competition we won for the Lavazza headquarters in Torino. It's, um, it's an industrial area that was quite close to the city. This was the existing situation. It was a totally enclosed block of the former power plant. And then the program is very interesting because we saved two buildings. We built the new offices, but also is a public square open to the public, an, an event room. You have two restaurants, you have the museum. So, as you see here, it's a quite good balance between the wooden buildings and the existing one. And we recuperated two of the existing buildings and the plexiglass one are the new headquarters. Existing situation, the new, the, this was the competition design. And again, I will not go through into detail. You have a big parking underneath, which is a public parking, a green area. This is the typical floor of the Lavazza headquarters, you have 700 people. And the final version of it, it took quite a long time. So it's, it's a building which opens up to the city. It really breaks this enclosure. 
but he wants to have an urban character. The fact is not just a glass facade, but it also have some kind of 3D factors, plus it's very important. On the right, you see an existing building who's been transformed into the Lavazza Museum. This is the site to the public garden. I'm trying to go quick. Torino has this feature of facade which wrap around the open space. The facade is very textured, but at the same time, it's very simple. You see the two meters parapets and two meters uh, windows. I insisted to make the windows that could be open for climatic reason, even if this, this is really, you know, in terms of heat balance. So the one you see are the open windows and we face all the offices on the outside part. So the idea that from the offices, you look at the city, you have a rather public atrium, you enter this atrium. And the only bit thing spectacular is a stair, which is, you see, these are the, the control points for employees, but the employees go up and down. So you go through the control. So on the outside here, you're already on the inside, you have a public space, but then this space is very used, it's, it overlooks. So it really makes a contact between the, the inner life of the brand. And people love these stairs. They go up and down. They even go up three, four floors because it's like a toboga. So it became a very popular piece. It's a little bit like, I don't know if the comparison is right. When you go to Rome, you have the Spanish steps. And it's an everyday Baroque, I would say. I would call this everyday Baroque. Can we put a little bit of excitement even in every, everyday life? Then when we dig down, we even found the Roman Basilica, the rest. So we changed the project again, just in time. So the people could see the Basilica. This was a very heavy thing because we totally had to change the, the underground parking. So this from the street, you will see, and we, the, the children can go and look at the this, uh, foundation of this Rom Romanesque Basilica. You have the shops. You have very nice environmental condition. We want the platinum, you know, lead the thing. Uh, they play table soccer. They have the gym. The, the appreciation of the quality by the employees is very high. You have a beautiful wireless terrace. So people in the summer go there and work. This is the entrance to the museum. So it's a whole museum of the Lavazza. Lavazza is a quite popular coffee in Italy. And this is the garden, still where it was not planted so high. So in between the building and the existing building, you have this quite nice garden, which is used by the population. And is both used by the employees. See, this is taken from up. And you can see the existing building recuperating. And we wrap around on the interior a new facade to host the, the, the stairs. This is a neighborhood, uh, say, feast uh, with the children of the neighborhood, we use, use the garden. So this garden is used both by the neighborhood, it's a very social place. And these are the employees of Lavazza, it's used by both. I go quickly, sorry, I tried to catch up with my time. This is the new facade in the old building, a very simple trilithic artificial stone. And then inside the reusal building, we had this big box, which is used for events, is very successful during events. Because, and we also designed the bar, the Lavazza bar for the reception. You can go up here, and here they have conventions, they have parties, bathrooms. And this is the cafeteria, which is open to everybody. So the employees use it, but you can also go normal people. So you just pay, it, it's very good. I would say, that I would skip this project. This is a residential project in Milano. I'm sorry, but I'm, I went out of time. A very urban housing of a little bit higher level. I just want to go all the way to the end. The atrium dialoguating with the existing city. So it's a, it's a residential building with a very textured facade and double faced. It has a stone facade on the outside and the garden. And these are two other buildings that are designed right next to it for another client. This is the housing on a very 
Oops, sorry. Um, go back. This was in Laveno on the Italian lakes, and it's, it's a lakefront uh, housing, as you see there, where it was an old factory, ceramic factory. So we had the occasion to build in front of a lake, which is not so easy, in a quite nice, uh, say, country environment. So all the, all, the, all the houses faced on the lake, and they have some kind of backside, like, a, okay? This is a housing project in Bologna, mixing free market housing and social housing. I like very much where I have the occasion to do both. And of course, they have very different construction costs. The one you see on the right is with bricks and is free market. And the one you see on, on the left there, so this is the free market, a little bit more precious with three color bricks and these metal elements. And the idea is to have the semi-enclosed courts. Sorry, I'm going so fast. And you see they're distinct, but they have some kind of continuity. So you're looking from the courtyard or the free market housing to the cheaper or plaster and cheaper detail uh, social housing, which is this. This is the social housing part. I'm sorry, I just have construction. I never take good pictures of my buildings. <laughs> okay, so public space, just two very quick project of just plain public space. One is the San Donai was a neighborhood park in a very suburban area. And the idea is to take all the, a park has not really functioned, the picnic area, you know, the step stones like this, and to make just a big one gesture of, these white pebble stones embracing the park. This is the children's game. And this is the night view of the day of the opening. And it's a very loved park. It's a neighborhood park where everybody goes there. It's a small town. So you can have some suburban robot, as I said. Okay, I would say this is quickly uh, another case of reusing a an industrial area, in this case, the Alfa Romeo factory. And the overall plan is by Gino Valle, he's a very good Italian architect, recently died from Udine. But I did all the black part. So my part is a sub master plan in a much bigger master plan. And you have social and uh, free market houses, very dense and very cheap. So all these, the construction costs are very small, but we always try to give some uh, outside terrace space also to people. This is the, the social part. The one you see the building is an office building with this cut. The diagonal was planned by Gino Valle, but all, all the rest is for ours. And the idea is to, get, to have a lot of opening to the existing city. This is a bit more precious free market houses, porticos. And the joke says, Chino, Chino, everything very nice, but we don't know where to hang our clothes. It's a comic about it. And in Milano, you have this sort of neo-Romanesque architecture. As you see this white and uh, red brick, it's a quite modernistic building, but somehow it has these echoes. So I don't mind this echo, but what I'm really happy about, it was a very troublesome quarter and you have this sort of nice use of public space. Okay, and I will finish with this project, which probably is the most well known out. It was the Jungas uh, factory. That was the existing situation. In 96, we won a, unexpectedly won a competition for a master plan. This was all a complete enclosed area. And we, we, it's a mixture of reuse and new buildings. We even opened a new canal. You see the situation, what it was. And then we did the master plan, but also I did the, all the buildings in black. 
So I got the chance to build it. This is a Google Air view. You see the red, the green with the new opening. And in some cases like this, we, we use the, an existing building and we turn it into a new building. But no, but this is basically an industrial building which is redesigned. Some buildings were a small substitution, in, like in this case. And the idea is that in Venice is a very delicate situation. So sometimes it's a contemporary building, but if you squint your eye, you can't quite see. So this is a new building substituting an existing one. Some of the buildings are conserved, they were industrial buildings. All the buildings there are in between revealing to be new. I didn't want to make an historical architecture, but then this is the new canal we built in the back of it. So it's always a, a game between new, old, tradition, because of the existing building were more industrial, more than being picturesque. It's the outskirts of Venice. That's a new building using existing foundation. As you see, that was the landscape. It's, it's the, the back of Venice, but you are, were also in the back of Palladio. So, and it was an existing smokestack. So this building, among the five, is the one who's more well known from me. The existing situation, you had, you crossed the bridge and you had a dead end. So we opened up and we cut through and the other building you saw before, and we kept the chimney. So in a way, urbanistics in Venice is like microsurgery. This is a uh, social housing, very cheap. You see, we, we try to keep the smokestack as a testimony. And for some strange reason, this building is the one who got most published abroad. Uh, I took a very typical motive of Venetian architecture, which is this white stone uh, around it. Actually, this is, is cut. We did through the other building to let all the people get to the new lagoon and square. And in a manneristic way, I would say, I did uh, the bathroom and kitchen windows, which are the square ones, and they don't need any obscuration, so they flush with the facade in a way. They are the one with the biggest corniche. The living rooms are the big ones we own only a seal, and the bedrooms are the one in between. So it's a kind of inversion transforming. This is real stone, but we transform it into a sort of graphic motif. And it's the closest things we could do for also for hygienic reason, for building regulation to the historical architecture. In this case, you have place to hang your clothes. And this is a bit of self joke, sometimes a bit sarcastic against the architects. And he says, uh, how do you do a building in Venice? You take a piece of butcher paper, you put on the record player a romantic song about this Italian folk singer, you think of your first love and you cry a bit, and you draw the windows where the teardrops have fallen. Of course, this is fun, but just to say that when you're in Venice, you need to deal with the issue of romanticism. And that's it. That's the way to design a building in Venice. We still don't know if we did Mondrian of, or picturesque. We try to understand that you cannot express yourself individually in Venice. I mean, the whole city is such a delicate thing that you almost don't have the right to say, you know, like, I'm dead, bang your head on the table. But then still, I resisted my client who wanted stylistic architecture. So it's like a camouflage. And I would end with this phrase, which to me is quite deep. It was written in 1923. It says, while the functionalist looks for the maximum possible adjustments to a goal as specific as possible, the rationalist is looking for the greatest chance of compliance to the largest number of necessities. Nothing more understandable for rationalists to put an emphasis of form. Form is bored with the establishment of human relationships. The lonely man isolated in the midst of nature has no form of God. The question of form arises together with the union of more individual, and form is the condition which makes possible man living together. The intuition that we can respond to everything, but in a way that form is also a social contract. I mean, this is quite deep. We have to embed Today, call it resilience, call it robustness, use any fashionable word, but 
since architecture survives the program we generated it, we cannot but not to respond to the program, but we have to put some uh, redundancy, I would say. You know, if one eye or one kidney, it stops working, we have to. So I think redundancy and openness is uh, a fundamental issue. The Giuseppe Lavazza, the head of Lavazza, called me up and said, Chino, you don't know how well your building is behaving in the COVID time. He explained me all the procedures they had in the offices. Because of this big atrium, we thought it was, now it's so useful, we could not live without this atrium anymore. So I think a building sometimes should be like a good, good clothes. You feel well in it. So here is just to show that I designed this house just for the place, but then also today architecture has a second life. The icon of this house has been reproduced over and over again. It is idea that once you make form and it's the right one, it somehow get reproduced, like I was trying to say in copycat. And I want to finish the idea, these are taken from Christopher Alexander, pattern language, that I think the city is not just a functional place, it's also a place, a romantic place we love. So before surrounding to the city, you know, like this, the city is still there waiting for us. And I think, at least in Europe, we are urban lovers. So I thank you very much for your attention and patience. Thank you. I'm sorry to have gone a bit out of time because of computer reasons. Ciao, ciao. Uh, I'm trying to respond to the questions. We have little time. One uh, question was, I read it. Thank you for your great presentation. Can you describe an evolution in your work from when you begin until today? It's difficult to respond to such different questions. I would say that I am 64 years old. I have a very strange education. I will not tell you all about my life. But when I was 17, I drove with a bus all the way to Afghanistan. Then I was lucky enough to have studied at MIT and I have a very scientific education. I came back in 78 in Milano and finished my uh, studies in the architecture. And that time, architecture was really, I would say, postmodernist. You had Aldo Rossi, Giorgio Cassi. And so I saw a lot of cultural pendulums. I had, uh, in a way, my mind to put together the super scientific education I had at MIT. I studied artificial intelligence, physics, chemistry, together with the very scholarly things. I also wrote a very scholarly book on uh, Milanese cultures from the 1700s. I redrawn all this. So my mind is in pieces, but then we attempt to put together. Paul Valéry says, our mind is made of disorder plus of a need to put order. This, I would say intellectually. Then I would say there is the mystery of form. Um, I make a, a quite tough example. I was some years ago in Rajasthan for tourism, and my son Pietro said, Papa, you're not buying that scarf. It has a swastika on it. And I said, of course, I will not buy the scarf. But Pietro, you have to understand that the swastika symbol in India is the symbol of the sun, is associated to Ganesh. Only Hitler took it out and made it with swastika. For an European, the swastika is Nazi and Hitler. But the, is the symbology of the swastika embedded in it or not? Which means that there's a history of forms uh, recently, we had the political issue of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul going back to be a mosque, but he was born to be a church and then like that. So it's one could say that, uh, you know, the Hermitage uh, was the, uh, the, the Tsar Palace and became a museum. So, on. so what we see is a non-direct 
relationship between forms and meanings. All the attempts, even what we call concepts, they always try to tie together forms and meanings. I've just did um, a competition in China, in Wuhan actually, and the Chinese woman of the studio, of Chinese studio said, we have to take uh, Wuhan symbology. The symbology of Wuhan is the phoenix. Why don't you make a building all like that? Because it looks like a phoenix. I said, uh, oh, we want the wow effect. I said, if you wanted the wow effect, maybe you should have gone to, uh, to Lady Gaga. And, and I said, but the idea of concept is not working the way you think. Otherwise, all Italian buildings would look like pizzas. And then she shut up, which means I think uh, today we are trying to mechanize too much the relationship between, uh, say, I icons and contents, but the history architecture we see architectures amping the original meaning and hosting. So this idea of welcoming. Many times when you show buildings, I try to explain very, 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 very quickly the condition of each project, but it would take one hour to explain every project, wh why it's born that way. But then in the end, for all this condition, the project enters in the flux of time and it has to behave well. Whatever the condition we generated it, it has to survive. So I would say in time, in this evolution, I learned from my young age to now, in a way to listen very much, to understand, to do the right thing in a situation, like Wittgenstein said, what is the right game to do? If you get it wrong, you really fuck up. Sorry, sorry about the thing. So to find the right character of a place, of a condition, of an economy, of a brand is fundamental. On the other side, I think, depends on very much by the function of the building, but you should embed into the building some values which are not directly derived from the program, which otherwise you do just marketing architecture. In a way, one could say the client is always right, in a way it's good, but then in a way you have to give the client something which is not just what he wanted, but something which could change in time. To me, this is maybe the evolution of my work. Then, of course, my wife said, Chino, when you were young, you would do architecture a little bit more bold. As you get old, you do all these little colors, these picturesque. I think you're not such a man anymore. Maybe the testosterone goes down. So one could say, I'm joking again, that you need, you change a little bit taste. Maybe I should go back to a little bit bolder architecture. Okay, this was the first. This, um, I read the question. The pandemic has added its component to all urgent challenges facing modern architects at the beginning of 2020. How possible is it in principle to create an urban architecture that will be safe during a pandemic, climatic, environmentally friendly, energy efficient, and at the same time sufficiently budgetary? Is it possible to reach all above goals? In December 2019, of maybe even January, I went to Holland uh, to see what is called the Student Hotel. It's an incredible place where you had co-working, co-housing, young, you know, it was the, it embedded all the idea about co-housing, co-working like this. And it really looking at this building, we had all kinds of function in it. I was almost, uh, changing my mind about functionalism, you know, like the fact that you, we need to put things together. Then I'm wondering one month later how that building, even the business of this building, going away. We are reasoning very much in office places, even in our own studios. I have the lucky of having a large studio, and everybody's asking somebody else, are you keeping distance? Today, we were talking to people, should we take down the mask and so on. So it's a complicated. But the question is, can you plan the city on this? Again, 
Isn't the city something which changes so slowly that uh, maybe it's arrogant to say that we can design a new city for this? If uh, COVID, of course, we can have other epidemies. Maybe we should make healthier places. People are rediscovering big, their own houses. You know, I, all my friends are saying, oh, how, you know, in a way they're discovering the homework. We're talking about it. But many of these issues are, they say, sociological issue. So the main issue is, can we directly translate sociology into spaces or not? Let me make an example. You know, we have these pictures of Piazza San Marco, the famous Italian square, totally deserted. But now I went to the pizzeria the other day and people were behaving like months ago. You didn't see even the pandemic. They were eating all together, laughing. Maybe it's not a very good behavior, but people want to stay together also. So my point is, even if we think of an architecture or a city, we should be really related to the conditions. Of course, a city is a human artifact. I would say that a good bench, well oriented to the sun or shaded under a tree, can host equally well cyberpunks, old gossip ladies, lovers who kissy kissy, and alone people who cry. The same bench can host our body the day of winning a competition and the day of the death of our parents. So is the bench related to our state of happiness? Yes, but you cannot determine that. In a way, Venice, it's a very nice place, but the rate of suicide in Venice is not bigger or less than a very shitty place, sorry. So, of course, it's nicer to have coffee in Piazza San Marco. There's a famous line by Francois Sagan. He says, it is better to cry in a limousine than in a subway, which means rich people, richness will not make people happy, but you know, he, she was, she's making it as a fun. Maybe it will release the condition. So I think a beautiful city with beautiful spaces will not totally change the life of people. I think socialism had had. We try to do social determinist. The USSR is a typical kind. If you think of constructive architects, you know they had, uh, you know, Narkonfin by Ginsburg, Mosaic Ginsburg, was the idea that you can build a new man just by reducing totally the private space and make it in common. When modernist architecture tried to do social engineering, it failed. So I think we can. Uh, make a beautiful love backdrop to our life, but we should not be too deterministic. So in the end, especially in urban design, of course, we can change a lot of people very quickly change. We are making boxes to contaminate, but I, I don't think the city in a way is really the time lapse to react to the COVID. Last thing, I'm worried about the next catastrophe could come from a very different place. Uh, I would warn the younger generation of this. We, today's society depends more and more for their life on computer artificial intelligence, okay? Imagine for a moment, and this moment, there's a ray that blows up all electricity and all computers. The, the, this is really a catastrophe movie. You know, all the planes start circling around. You go to get money from the banks and it's not there. The gas station does not work. The train would collapse. That's the big one is not another epidemic. The big one is the collapse of informatics, information technology, and today more and more we delegate to machine. So the catastrophe American movies, in a way, will be probably more reached by the collapse of information technology. That's the big one. And are we getting ready for that? I don't see, no, because we're talking about smart city, smart city. But, you know, if humans will not be able, 
I'm not against computers, of course. I use computers very much. We are today using, even during the COVID, you know, even old people, my mother, my grand, you know, uh, they had to be forced to electronic communication. So that's a very good side. But there would be a moment that we have to make a calculation by hand, maybe even in my studio geometry by hand. I know very good uh, geometry. I could do perspectives by hand and nobody can does it. One hour ago, while I was explaining to my graphic the, say, the theory of the shadows, which is a very classical theory in Beaux-Arts. Every student of the Beaux-Arts knew how to do shadows. The young kid, they only used the computer. They tried to redraw it, but not knowing the grammar, they can just copy it because they don't know the theory of shadows anymore. So I would say, I don't want to say everything has not to change. I think ecology and sustainability is the big issue of our time, absolutely. And, but I think in the end, we should do very good human environments. Okay, thank you very much for your patience. I'm really sorry I went a little bit overboard. And I wish everybody a thank you for your attention. And I hope I can meet you all in person at the end of the pandemic or some other time.